Welcome to the Radical Lifestyle Podcast, brought to you by Generation to Generation, where you'll be inspired by the past, equipped for the present, and prepared for the future as we engage in conversations with people from around the world. If you've been inspired by the guests that we've had on the podcast, please like, subscribe, comment, hit notification bells, whatever you can do on the platforms that you're listening on, so that more people have the opportunity of hearing these and engaging in our community. Hello everyone, this is Andrew and Daphne from Generation to Generation and our guest today is Brian Greenaway. Brian, for people that don't know who you are, can you just say a bit about where you're from and what you do? Sure. Hi everyone. Yep. Uh, as Andrew said, well, it's good to be with you today, first of all. Excellent. Um, yep. So I am based near in South London. I am an Assemblies of God pastor on the leadership team of an AOG church in the Bromley area. But uh, what I do full time is that I'm the director of an organization called Ma'oz Israel UK. It's a Messianic Jewish ministry, so it's Jewish believers in Jesus that's been based in Israel for 45, well, over 45 years now, and I head up the UK side of things. And then for people that hear this, they want to find out more, where can they do that? Okay, well, we've got a website. It's marzisrael.uk. It's quite simple. Maoz, that's M-A-O-Z, and that uh, actually Maoz is the Hebrew word for strength or stronghold. So it's marzisrael.uk, and that's all about us there. Okay, and I'll put that link in the description box. So if you're listening, it's there ready for you to go and check out. So let me try and say this right. Maoz. Maoz, that's right. Wonderful. Ma- ma- okay, yeah. I don't want to be saying it wrong for the whole podcast. <laughs> so, <laughs> so for people listening, they're probably already going, wait a minute, I haven't heard of this. I don't. You, you said what the word meant, so which was something I was going to ask. So can you tell us a little bit about the organisation and a little bit about what you do in it before we backtrack? Sure, sure. Well, I'm a, a Jewish believer in Jesus, or a Messianic Jew, some call us. And um, so that's um, a, a Jewish person who's decided that, uh, and recognised the Messiahship of Yeshua. And um, what we actually do as an organisation is that we are focused on outreach. Um, so I, as the director of the UK, head up all our links with churches that fund our work. So our principal aim, obviously, is to is to reach Israel with the gospel, whether that's Jew or Arab. And uh, when the ministry first started, it was started by um, a couple called Ari and Shira Sokoram. They're in their 80s now, but still involved, although not leading the the ministry. And uh, they planted a congregation, one of the first congregations in Israel, actually, in the sort of early 1970s. So they're quite pioneering, really, in planting this this congregation where at that time there was probably less than 20 uh, Jewish believers in Jesus. Now, that congregation began to grow as the land of Israel began to grow. And as more and more believers came into the land and first of all most believers came into the land rather than come to faith there um, they realized that they needed to help people you know that, that there was all sorts of help that was needed so they started to raise up a grant fund they started to translate um, good good christian books into hebrew and they started to support and mentor other leaders as well so that's from their sort of early beginnings that's grown into our four aims which is outreach aid uh, publishing and worship and so our latest area of work is a real emphasis on worship we believe that there that you know israel is called to be a light to the nations it says that in the bible and they are in many areas in science in agriculture in medicine in all those areas but spiritually they're not <laughs> if you've been to israel you'll know that um if anyone's on the podcast and not been to israel i've known people who've gone there and said wow, this space is so liberal. <laughs> um, so they're not yeah. really a light to the world. So we are raising up a generation of worshippers. We have a, a studio in Jerusalem, one of the best ones in the land, where we train worship leaders, artists, musicians, help to develop worship leaders, and also fund children who have abilities in the musical area. So there's all these different areas of our work that we do. And of course, my my principal area is, is yes, to raise funds for that work. Uh, to keep our, our supporters informed, but also to work with UK churches, giving them a balanced view of Israel. Um, before we dive more into that, can you just give us a bit of your background? Um, I mean, how did you come to a faith in Jesus? In sure. Yeshua? Right. Yeah, <laughs> Jesus is fine. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, I grew up in, a, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm Jewish, but I grew up in a non-religious home. So we didn't do any practicing of faith or anything like that. Although being Jewish, I had a very real interest in spiritual things. And the thing about Jewish people is if they do have an interest in spiritual things, they will not be interested in Christianity. 
because that's going to the enemy. <laughs> that's the way they view it. So I grew up with a home where there was quite a lot of spiritualism in my home um, on my mother's side. So I got involved in from low level stuff such as tarot cards and graphology to right through to spiritualism and all sorts of stuff, which nearly destroyed me. So at the age of 20, I was very ill. And, you know, I remember thinking to myself, I'm going to be dead within a year. There's no hope in this world. I'm searching for some sort of spiritual experience and I can't find it in any of these things I've looked at. And then I began working with two young ladies who um, told me about Jesus. They said, oh, you know, this, that and that about Jesus. So I gave the Jewish excuse and that was ah, Jew Jesus. I said, he's got nothing to do with the, the Jewish people. He's some Italian import, which is what we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> they, the Romans just brought him in to invent some religion called Catholicism. And that's one of the excuses. But of course, the other thing was, I, although I'd never been involved in sort of formal church or even formal Judaism in any way, one thing I did have was a hatred of the church, a hatred of Christians. Whenever I saw Christians on the television, I used to swear and shout and really hate them. And I didn't really know why. But it's because, you know, in the Jewish mindset, through 2000 years of history, we've had those who called themselves the church called themselves Christians, who have persecuted believers, killed, uh, not believers, persecuted Jewish people in the fact, in tens of thousands, even more. In fact, of course, many Jewish people point to the Holocaust and say, yes, that's what Christians do to us. So I had that background, which a lot of Jewish people have, that, that yeah. apologetic that needs to be done. And um, so when I was about 21, I was invited to come to a Christian meeting, which I did do. It was called the Four Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship International. And I went to this meeting and they seemed to be quite reasonable people there. They weren't crazy. And I chatted to these other guys. And then they did the weirdest of thing. They started to sing and raise their hands. And I thought, oh, man, they were crazy. These guys are crazy. But, you know, I'd met them already. I had a relationship with them. And I thought, well, they're not that crazy. They're like me. Um, and, of course, I was searching for something spiritual, searching for something, a spiritual experience. And when I was invited to church, and this was the first time I ever went to a church where there was like you know, a Pentecostal church it was but it was a live church and I thought there's something spiritual here there's something benevolent that cares about me that loves me and so I made a I made a commitment to follow Jesus at only the second Christian meeting I ever went to because I just saw what was happening there and uh, you know God is good and he's kept me I was when I was 21 I'm now 56 so God has been faithful all these years he really has <laughs> yeah you mentioned uh some of this sticky relationship between the Jewish people and, and the church or Christians. Um, and even you had to wrestle through some of that. You know, you mentioned that uh, with Maoists, there's the outreach side of it. People may not understand quite fully uh, some of this tricky relationship historically. Um, maybe you could just unpack that a little bit more, but also how do you, uh, how do you wrestle through that with, with Maoists? Yes, it always is one of the most difficult issues. Um, I can remember um, being on uh, by the museum in Jerusalem at one time with a friend of mine, Ron Cantor, some may have heard of. Yeah. Ron and I were just chatting. Uh, he was, and a lady came and spoke to him in Hebrew. And then he started speaking English. He said, oh, you're from England. He said, so, so is he, some English. And, oh, nice, blah, blah. And then he said, then he said the, the, the terrible word. He said, we are messianic believers in Jesus. And she exploded. She said, you're taking away our identity. Blah, blah, blah. That's, this was a very Jewish Israeli conversation. You got it? Because instead of him saying, oh, well, God loves you. He said, who do you think you are? He said, I live here. My children have served in the idea. Do your children. I thought, wow, this is, is this evangelism? Um, <laughs> as, a, as, a, as a freak. But what he got around to saying was, you know, we are still Jewish people. And we still, you know, keep our identity but we're believers but of course her problem was she was looking back to history which is coming to your question Andrew sorry I'm coming back to no you're no, good, no, that's good. <laughs> she's looking back to history and she's saying why are you two Jewish men following this God that has destroyed our people in every nation and in every country and um she I suppose you know she didn't really understand that there is you know, that bit through life there's been political Christianity isn't there that's been controlled by the state right through history and if we look back through to the church fathers and even those who, you know, we hold in esteem, like Martin Luther, who became very anti-Semitic towards the end of his life. Now, there's a good lesson. End well. <laughs> he didn't really in that sense. <laughs> uh, but, um, but it is an apologetic we have to have with Jewish people. We have to explain to them, those who really love the Jewish Messiah will really love his people. 
And one of the messages that we often say is this, is that we know that we owe a great debt. And the believers in Jesus owe a great debt to the Jewish people for their book. It's their Jewish book. It's their heritage. It's what's given to them. But what many, what many people don't realize is that most of the Jewish apostles died for Gentiles. They gave their life for Gentiles. They gave their lives, you know, to, like just Thomas, who died in India, took the gospel to the Gentiles. You know, and what we often say to Jewish people is if it was that important, you know, that these Jewish people died, surely it's something worth thinking about. But we know that many Christian organizations have done some really good work in apologizing because we can't they can't put right what has been done wrong. But it's acknowledging that those who really love the Lord, really love Jesus, just, you know, should understand the scripture and see what a debt is owed but you know with jewish people it is difficult it is it is, it is the most difficult barrier to get over to explain to them that it is political christianity that's persecuted them and not true believers we had um, a moment where the deeply deeply rooted perception really showed itself and we have had the privilege a few times of bringing um, well, these are from America, 13-year-old Jewish boys who have given their lives to their Messiah. And we have managed to have a bar mitzvah at the Western Wall, um, undercover, messianic it was, the whole thing. And it's such a privilege to see these young boys in the setting of their peers in Jerusalem having a bar mitzvah. Anyway... So one family came and they brought the grandmother with them who was Reformed Jewish, something like that. And she wasn't a believer and they brought her with us, which was a great privilege. I mean, just such an honour. Anyway, we're standing at the Western Wall and, of course, us women are looking over the wall, over the dividing petition. And I purposely stood next to her and here she is watching her grandson with the whole regalia going on with this bar mitzvah. And I just turned to her and I said, now do you believe that your daughter hasn't given up being Jewish? Our daughter was there and all the rest of it. Now do you believe it? Well, Brian, she turned around to me as quick as anything. She says, Daphne, you don't understand. They have a Christmas tree. <laughs> and that was the reason... That was like the, they crossed the line. They crossed the line by having a <laughs> Christmas tree. And it was like, okay, I, I don't quite know where to take it from the Christmas tree <laughs> to, oh, to nice. Yeshua and them. But, <laughs> but, it, but it does show how, yeah. how deeply ingrained it is and how tragic okay. it is. We had uh, another friend who um, he's a uh, he's Jewish, Jewish lawyer in in. The U.S. Oh yeah, that's and uh, we'd read a book um, called "Our Hands Are Stained with Blood" by yes. Dr. Michael Brown, yes, uh, which is all about um, the church, what the church has done to the Jewish people throughout history. Um, anyway, as as a part of us kind of taking some sort of ownership with our friend, we said, "Hey, th look, we've just read this book. We think you might find it really interesting." Um, and so we we gave it to him to to read, and he's and known us years. He's known us a long we time. We stayed in his home. Yeah, um, and uh, he looked at the title and said, "Oh, is this about how we killed Jesus?" Mm. <laughs> and it was like, mm. "No, that's not that's not what this is about." And we had to quickly explain what it was. But it just shows someone that we've known for years just how deep seated this this is. Uh, yeah. into into the Jewish community. It's almost like a, um, a national and an ethnic trauma that is trigger. We we are a trigger to it. That's a good analogy. I've never thought of that yeah, before. Yeah, that's true. It is very true. Yeah, yeah. And it's interesting, isn't it, that you know when um, you know when it comes to making aliyah, the Jewish people want to make aliyah. You know, the um, atheists, they can be Buddhists, they can be anything they like, but. They can't be followers of Jesus. <laughs> it is, you know, it's that sticking point, isn't it? Which is tragic, really. It really is very tragic. So going back to your story, okay, what was your family's reaction when you decided to follow this Jesus? Well, it's very interesting, really. Um, I mean, it, 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 one of those two young, there's a message here. If, you, if there are people that are younger and want to get married, 
then my answer is always do the will of God. So because one of those young ladies that told me about Jesus became my wife later on. So well, there's a message there, isn't it? Angelize and God will work anyway. <laughs> so, yes. Yeah, so um, my dad, because I'd been so ill uh, previously, because I almost destroyed myself with these different spiritual experiences. When my mum and dad saw the change, they were amazed. You know, that, and my dad himself came to faith. He did slip on it. He went a bit colder, but he's going on well now. Um, but he he was amazed at the change and it impacted him. However, my my Jewish grandmother uh, wasn't good. It wasn't good at all. And she wasn't happy. And she used to, I mean, she was a tough lady. She'd been an alcoholic for many years. And um, she, um, so she used to take the mickey, write letters, be quite nasty. But some, but God had his plans, you know, God has his plans because she ended up divorcing my grandfather, moving down into Sussex um, to reasons of her own. And then one day she wrote me this letter. She wrote this letter saying that she took me a, a picture of her garden and she sent me a picture and said, wrote to the back, the best place to be with God is in the garden. So I um, contacted my dad and I said, oh, man's not being nice again. He said, I think you need to go and see her. He said, something has happened. And uh, so I went down to visit her. And what had happened was that these two um, uh, Church of England guys had knocked on her front door, door knocking, evangelizing. And she had come to faith through their witness. And she was radically transformed. She lost her, her physical sight. After, she got her spiritual sight, but she lost her physical sight after that. And a few years later, she passed away. And I went to a funeral. And at her funeral, there's all these people saying, what a lovely believer that she was how she loved God and she loved other people and I thought who's this person's funeral I'm at this isn't my grandmother <laughs> God transformed her in the last few years of her life <laughs> even though she rejected and didn't want anything to do with what I did God just intervened um so that was good you know it's good to, to, to know that I'll see her in heaven one day see her in, in eternity one day because of God intervening um but yeah that's that's uh, that's like the Jewish side of my family. <laughs> Just for people in America or some other countries, a very English phrase was used, which was oh. to take the Mickey. Yeah, and so oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just so they they understand Mick in England off. to take the Mickey or take the Mick or to make is to make fun of someone. It, so yeah it's, yeah, it's nothing to do with Disney World. No, nothing to yeah, do with Mickey Mouse. <laughs> nothing, nothing like that. <laughs> so we were talking about the situation in the UK and. Um, Apart from nations where there is a very political bias against Israel, I mean, we've been in Malaysia, for example, you know, that the enormous um, signs by the side of the road support Palestine, we, those sort of nations. I mean, they can lose their citizenship if they visit Israel. So apart from nations like that, I would think that the situation in the UK could be mirrored in many, certainly, Western nations. Have you personally had any... Have you been the recipient of anti-Semitism? Are you talking about in the church or outside? No, I'm talking in life. Just in life. Him, Brian. Yeah, yeah I mean, all, uh, you just get used to it. When I was growing up at school, I went to school in Beckenham and in south london sorry south london and um i became my group were me and another jewish guy paul paul Karwoski, and an asian guy and an african guy because we were seen as the outsiders and the school then was predominantly white and so but we were the outsider people you know because of our, our backgrounds etc so we were sort of got together in that but yeah there always has been there's always been people who've made comments you know it's funny because you get used to them and you think back and you think, yeah, actually, that those those idea, the things they said, the the comments that that you know, using the word yid or four by two, which is Scotty Ryan, so things like that, just using it in in conversation, we just got used to it. My dad did as well. He was a London taxi driver, and uh, you know, there was clearly a line between the Jewish London taxi drivers and and the, and the Gentile ones. They stood in different lines in the, in the what's called the carriage office where they uh, they uh, were there to do business, etc. And all through my time and even now even my son has experienced it as well so it's just it seems to be that people just do that and in and in church as well yes i've been to dinner in people's houses and they've made comments like oh the jewish people have all the money anyway don't they and i thought that's anti-semitic it's just ingrained in society isn't it that the jewish people have these you know these views that have been handed down from generation to generation they really have and have you noticed an increase in anti-Semitism in the last few years? 
Yes, definitely. Yeah. I mean, uh, there is a statistic which I heard just at the weekend that said uh, if you are Jewish, you're four times more likely to receive um, abuse or even physical abuse if you're Jewish. Uh, I think it's five times in America, actually. So it is definitely rising. And a lot of our Jewish friends, that I know Jewish people, they when we had the problems with the last Gaza situation, so this is talking, looking over the last five years, I know a lot of friends who have just got things together. They're the British citizens, but they've made sure they've got their Israeli citizenship. They've made sure they've put their money in places where they can transfer it to Israel quickly. They've made arrangements so they can leave. And they say, I'm not having my children grow up in this sort of situation. And we, you know, as Jewish people say, never again. It's not going to happen to us again. But we can see the signs that with people saw in the 20s and particularly into the 1930s in Europe, they can see those signs happening again. And, and so a lot of Jewish people are making arrangements to make sure they can leave quite quickly. It's tragic, really. Which is a lesson learnt from history, sadly, because pre-1940s and that the signs were there and nobody did anything. So yeah. sadly, in the circumstances, it's, it's a good thing, but... Um, and so, so what about in the church? Because we think, oh, the church is all loving. You know, we love everybody and we welcome them and come on in. Can you talk to us about, you said you go to different churches. What do you find among the churches? And you're talking about the UK, but like I said earlier, I can imagine that this is multiplied across nations. It's not just a UK thing. Mm-hmm. Well, I say right at the beginning that I believe in the church. You know, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The true church, those that love him and love his, what he loves and he loves Israel, is always going to be there, isn't it? But there is elements in the church where there is a lot of ignorance. You know, there's people who, and I use ignorance in the kindest possible word, that they, they just do not see the biblical case for Israel. They do not understand it. Uh, funny, I had a, a comment just the other day, uh, someone saying that when uh, people from Muslim faith come to faith, they, they tend to take the Bible literally, like they take the Quran literally. And so they see Israel straight away and have a love for Israel. And it's very true. But the church has 2000 years of history that it doesn't even understand. That's the problem. It doesn't look back. And we think ourselves, oh, I'm in the church, maybe, you know, I'm free and and this is what we do in our church. And we set our own vision and we do this, that and the other. But we are all subject to history that's been handed down to us and um, you know people talk about rabbinical judaism and say oh it's so far from the bible and it is but actually canon law that's been handed down through church history for two thousand years has moved a lot of what the church believes in its foundations away from biblical christianity and um i don't know if any of our listeners or viewers know about this statement that was made and you know we talk about the established church and i did earlier but the german pentecostal church in 1938 issued an edict which said they agreed with the racial policies of the fatherland and that the pushing out of the Jewish people was God's will and that's quite shocking I'm a I'm a Pentecostal minister and yet that was the Pentecostal church that said that so what leads a church to make that decision what leads a church that claims to be Pentecostal which was a new denomination at that time of signs and wonders to agree with the policies of a government that says that they agree with eventually what happened in Germany, maybe not entirely with the Holocaust, but agreed with the policies of, you know, identifying Jewish people and 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 doing what they did in the in the mid thirties. Um, so yeah, I go around to churches now, yeah, and you get what you, I mean. That is supersessionism. That's another word we give replacement theology. So you have punitive supersessionism which we saw right through history where jewish people were punished were uh, by people who were in the church made to wear stars you know that was a church invention uh, pushed out of certain communities and of course murdered as well but what we have now is economic supersessionism it sounds very grand doesn't it? these words nothing to do with money <laughs> um, but where the church has chosen to say these are the this is the jewish people god's put them aside in his plans he's made a decision to put them aside and make the church the new Israel. And people don't see a problem with that. They think that's okay. And I've come across that quite a few different times in churches saying, you know, well, you know, now we're the new Israel. We've replaced them, which is anti-Semitic. I tried to do my best because, you know, you talk to churches and you don't go to a church leader or church and say, 
by the way, you're anti-Semitic. <laughs> that doesn't tend to go down too well. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I tried to be nice in my thoughts and think, well, you know, they're not anti-Semitic. But actually the whole idea of replacement theology, of super, it was big words we have, superpositionism, uh, is anti-Semitic at its core. Because it's saying these are the Jewish people. They are no longer God's people. They are no longer important to God. They are no, you know, God doesn't care about them anymore. God has forsaken his promise. And many churches do believe that in ignorance. They say it nicely, but actually it is at the core anti-Semitic. And so having a conversation with pastors, with leaders, is something I do on a regular basis to try and help them see um, that that's what's at the core of that whole theology. Well, it's it's even not... I mean, it is anti-Semitic, 100%. Yeah. But worse than that, it's calling God a liar, yes. which you also don't go in and say. I do understand. You say... It's probably well, not your first actually, line. Actually, no. you're calling God a liar and you're anti-Semitic. might not get you a second invite. Not a good but, start. <laughs> but, you know, I, there were two things we say, and we try to make it real short because I just think pastors and leaders, they've heard so much that, that they're tuned out. And so we say two things. One we say is, well, if he God can break, he say, I've made covenant with you and break it because you sinned, we're in grave danger because yes. he made covenant with us and if we sin. But the thing I found with many leaders is just to say to them, look, when you read the Bible, every time God makes a promise to Israel and it says forever, perpetual, eternal, everlasting, if it uses any word like that, just circle that word. And, and I had one pastor say to me, Daphne, everybody's extreme on this. I felt like saying I am too, but I, I didn't. He said, tell <laughs> you me can what, control it a little what, more than other what do you think? And I just said that to him every time there's one of those words, circle it. And he stopped for a minute and then he just said, thank you, Daphne. And so I think it is getting back to the simplicity that everlasting means everlasting or do we not have everlasting life? I mean, yeah. we'd just better go through and cross all those words out. Indeed. But, I mean, we we know, I mean, you know, we know, this isn't a battle that you can rationalise or... If, if, we, if we put it at that level, we'd go mad, I think... Yeah. We'd go mad. So can you talk to us from your perspective? What is the real issue underlying this? What, what is the battle? Why is there so much division, et cetera, et cetera? Why the battle over Jerusalem? Why the battle over this land? What's it all about? Because it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> yeah, it's all about, as you say, the good God's promises, isn't it? And the thing that I, you know, there's a number of theologians that ask the question about what's the most important chapter in the Bible? What's one of the key chapters in the Bible? And that key chapter that a number of them will say, and I can quote their names, people would have heard of them, is 2 Samuel chapter 7. And then I often say that in churches, and people get their Bibles out and they're thinking, what does that say? <laughs> now, that's the, 2 Samuel 7 is the promise to David. Okay, It's the promise of his son who will sit upon his throne. And, you know, what's driving world history at the moment is that promise, because, you know, OK, it was a, an immediate promise that it would be Solomon. And we know that that was fulfilled. But if you look at that covenant promise as it unfolds, the Davidic covenant, of course, it is talking about Jesus, who will one day come from David. In fact, not through Solomon, but through Nathan, his other son. Um, but he would come through um, as a descendant of David. and He would sit on David's throne. Now, that, I believe, is the key driver to world history at the moment, that there is a Jewish Messiah who will one day return and sit on the throne in Jerusalem. And that is what Satan wants. I mean, we know he knows he can't stop that happening, but he wants to deceive the church. He wants to deceive the world. He wants to stop, you know, whatever he can for people realizing that truth. And that is the key battle in the spiritual, the key geopolitical event that's happening, that's going to happen in the future, is the return of Jesus to Jerusalem. And so if the church is blinded to that, if it cannot see this Jewish Messiah that's returning, then it will not really understand the whole narrative of the Bible. And I think it's why so many believers in church don't really even understand the Bible. You know, they'll read their, their nice, what I call fridge magnet texts. You know, people have them on the fridges. 
Um, these texts they get to know, God so love the world, you know, God will provide all your needs according to his riches in Christ. They know these texts, but even then they don't know the context of them. They certainly don't know the context, most of them, of the Old Testament and the promises and they, the progressive revelation that was brought through. You know, David uses the covenant name Adonai Yahweh. He uses that there in 2 Samuel 7 because he is realizing the last time it was used was Abraham because the promise made to Abraham has moved on and he's realizing that God has given him a progressive revelation that talks about the rest of the history of the world. And I think that's what the key battle is. It's about the belief in the promises of God that progressive revelation is bringing, uh, is showing us that one day this Jewish Messiah will sit on the throne of David. And so, you know, there's an obscurity to that in the church. They don't see that. They don't see why Israel is so important. They don't see why the promises of Israel are so important. And so that God, you know, Satan is able to blind them and say Israel isn't important anymore. Then, of course, if you don't understand that, you don't understand the political scene. You don't understand what's happening economically. You don't understand what world affairs is all centered on. And that is the return of Jesus to Jerusalem. Yeah, there are so many layers to this. Um, what do you say to people who maybe maybe there are pastors or leaders listening to this and they say, look, I'm supportive of Israel. Um, I I agree with what you're saying, but this is just way too controversial for me to talk about in a church service to address it attracts way too much heat the political scene uh, all that kind of stuff so they they agree from a theological standpoint but they don't necessarily want to be too out there with it publicly because of the heat that it attracts um, have you had conversations with leaders on that kind of end of things and, and what do you say to people about that sure yeah there's the two sides doesn't there there's the, the cultural and then there's the political and i will also say well this is a political thing isn't it and um, and uh, but, you know, I remember talking to one leader and um, a friend. It wasn't me who asked the question; it was a friend of mine who asked him the question. You know, do you ever teach on end times? And he said, "Oh no," he said, "I never speak from the beginning or the end of the Bible because it's far far too controversial." <laughs> <laughs> Just take the middle section. <laughs> I know that's right. A nice bit. <laughs> that's crazy. Um, Sorry, yeah. but I've got to compose myself now. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear that is tragic and it's a shame isn't it really you know we're called to be ministers of the gospel as as pastors you know which means being controversial in a sense in itself it means declaring the whole counsel of god and it is easier and it's tragic to see that some churches and i don't want to i'm not thinking of pointing the finger at anyone because i love the church have become sort of behavior management centers you know what i mean just just sort of delivering something that helps people to live a happy and healthy and trouble-free life. Um, but that isn't what the church is called to, is it? It's certainly, you know, in the West, we're certainly soft when it comes to many countries where the church is persecuted. But yeah, people do want to avoid the political. But I think that sometimes there's terms, isn't it? Terms are, are strange, aren't they? Now, I never use really the word Zionist. I am a Zionist. I'm a biblical Zionist. I believe God's plans for Israel are to bring them back to the land he has, to bless them there, to pour out his spirit, and for them to come to know him as Messiah. And that's the biblical Zionist. Now, there is the political Zionist side of things that people do get very uncomfortable with. And yes, that needs to be addressed in the conversation because there are some, there are some believers, there are some Christians who have made mistakes. They've made mistakes going down the cultural route and they've made mistakes in thinking that the Jewish people are, are, are perfect and they never do anything wrong they yourselves have been to israel some of our viewers will as well they'll know that israel is no way perfect at all and um, we know what we're like um the promises of god are upon us and you know if you and if you say to a jewish person and some some christians do oh you're god's chosen people they might say something like yeah chosen to suffer that's right i wish you'd <laughs> um, choose someone you else that's right go and choose someone else you know <laughs> Why have you chosen us, Lord? Uh, is that sort of conversation. But Israel is by no means perfect. And we mustn't fall into that trap of waving the Israeli flag and saying everything does. A certain prime minister is, is uh, you know, perfect and every choice he makes is right or a certain leader is right. And Israel always does it. They, you know, we are, as Jewish people, wrestling. Now, we know the story of Jacob and we wrestled the angel. And we know that sometimes in the scripture, God calls Israel Jacob because they're acting like Jacob. 
And sometimes they do act like Israel and he calls them Israel. Um, and so we as Jewish people are still struggling. We're still wrestling with God like Jacob did back then. And so we're still in that state of imperfection. So, so I think that, you know, with regard to leaders, and they say it's too political. I would say to them, yes, OK, so I'm Jewish. You know, I know my people aren't perfect. I know we're not making the right decisions. But despite that, God has put a promise on us. And there are certain things which Christians are responsible for and some things they're not. And God said he will bring his people back to the land and he will bless them. Now, while we rejoice in what God is doing, our responsibility is the gospel. It's bringing the gospel to our local community, to our local context, but also bringing the gospel to Israel as well. Our responsibility is not to do the political stuff and to to be an advocate for things that are wrong sometimes, that Israel does do wrong and acknowledge that. And it's acknowledging really the imperfection of man, and but God's plans working through that. I think um, what we, I mean, we have to remember sometimes is that Israel, Jerusalem is becoming and will become more and more, I believe, not only the center where where God is going to bless, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but it's going to be the center where all evil is let loose as well, because it, it it is a battle between God and Satan like no other. So you're going to see the evil let loose. Um, I think also it's getting it down to really the brass tacks, and we're actually as a ministry working through the 150 end time chapters in the Bible right now. So for anybody who doesn't want to talk about the end times, just go and rule out 150 chapters and get on with the rest of it. But There are more than 150, but some of them people might debate over. Yeah, so, so at least 150. Yeah. So, um, and I think this, this business of, of Israel and, and the land and the, and the city baseline, God says, this is my land. And I choose the Jewish people to have custodian for me. So it's not even like, oh, well, this belongs to the Jewish people. No, actually, it's God's. It's the own, you know, it's where he said, this is mine. And my choice of custodian of this land is the Jewish people. So, you know, all the time you have to get back to what's really underneath it, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely right, isn't it? Yeah. Absolutely right. Well, I'm, I'm glad we're right. We're still friends in this conversation. <laughs> maybe, um, maybe, maybe as we start coming to the end, uh, you said, you know, there are things that we are not responsible for. Um, it's not in our control, but there are certain things which are that we are responsible for. And we've talked a bit about some of the church history, how it's really difficult, uh, anti-Semitism, and how that's increasing. Um, you know what. What is in our control, maybe just as individuals or, or as a, a body of believers, wherever you're located? What are things that we can do that are in our control and that we should be responsible for in terms of how we stand up for Israel or how we address Israel? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, there is a statistic that's a couple of years old now. And um, and uh, I ask this question sometimes of people. I say, um, and it is a couple of years old now. So. And it shows, the statistic is that over $200 million of Christian money, if you like, in the States goes to Israel every year. And and I say to them, what do you think it's mostly spent on? And I give a list. So I give a list of humanitarian aid, the gospel, the idea, settlements, um, food banks, and stuff like this. And I let them sort of think it through. And then I tell them the answer. The majority or the largest percentage of that funding that goes from Christians to Israel goes to settlements. The second one is humanitarian aid. And the third one is the IDF. And then it you know, goes down from there percentage by percentage. And, um, you know, I ask the question as, as uh, to Christians and I say, um, so what are we, what does the Bible tell us? What did Jesus leave us with to do? And it was the Great Commission. And, you know, I'm not saying people shouldn't give money to those projects but I think the most important thing is the gospel I think the most important now that can come through humanitarian aid of course it can Um, but I think the most important thing that we have to orientate is that I am a Jewish person and I think of three things firstly I think of Jesus weeping over Jerusalem 
You know, he never said, oh, I've had enough of you guys. Uh, I'm clearing off. He wept over Jerusalem. And the Apostle Paul had that same heart. You know, he said, may I be cut off? May I be a curse for my people? Now, he knew he couldn't be because Moses had already offered himself years ago. <laughs> And it, he, God didn't offer that then, and he knew he wasn't going to take Paul's offer on that. But, but Paul's heart desire was to see his people saved. And so we as believers, whether we are Jewish believers or, or Christian or Gentile believers, we must have that in our heart. And uh, whether that's by doing good works, which is always important, of course, demonstrating a repentant attitude, we must always have the gospel at heart. Because whether a Jewish person is in New York or whether they're in Manchester or whether they're in the Ukraine, or whether they're in Israel, if they don't know the Lord Yeshua as their Lord and Saviour, when they die, they will go to a godless eternity forever and ever. And so at the heart of what we do at Mars, and the heart of what I believe, is that it has to be gospel orientated. And so we have a, a responsibility, if you like. What we can do is pray and give and support the gospel in Israel. I mean, that's the most important thing. Yeah. And I will add a generation to generation most important thing. Add, not take away, add yeah, yeah, the most yeah. important. Anti-Semitism is rising. The next generation support Israel far less than we support we and my generation and my parents' generation. My parents actually were praying in Israel nineteen sixties or before. Um I don't know a day when I didn't wasn't supportive of Israel. My children don't know a day. And so we have to ask ourselves as a generation, why does the next generation fall in? Why don't they know to the same degree that we know about God's plans and purposes for Israel, where really it should increase through the generations? And so I would say we have a biblical responsibility, all of us, to tell the next generation and if everybody today who um, who is supportive as, of Israel and has some biblical understanding, however limited, if everybody told two of the next generation, we would begin to turn it around. So can I add that to our most important thing to do as well? Yeah, 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 yeah. We are, you know, our legacy is what we pass on, isn't it, really? And you're absolutely right, definitely. I couldn't agree with you more. Yeah, yeah. The next generation, the responsibility. So, we are empowered. We are empowered to do many things. Good question, Andrew. And um, let, let's put what you said and what we said together, and boy, we'll be turning the world yeah. around. Agree <laughs> with that definitely. <laughs> yeah, Brian. Thank you so much uh, again for for people listening. the The website for Maos Israel is in the description box. So go check that out. Uh, see if there are ways uh, if, after hearing this if you want to support what they're doing um, I'm sure there'll be information on the website where you can do that uh, Brian thank you so much we really appreciate it. it's been really good to hear some of your background but also just to hear your perspective on things which are going on right now uh, I think there's some really useful information at the end there in, in practical steps of how people can get involved so thank you so much thank you be good to be with you Thank you for listening to this episode. Remember, if it inspired you, share it with others so we can see more people engaged in this community.